Hi guys, so this PowerPoint is going to be over fracture complications. There's a lot of them, but I'm going to try to break them down a little bit and maybe make them easier to understand for you. So there are a lot of complications. There's complications of immobility, like uh, getting blood clots, forming ulcers, especially like stomach ulcers, things like that. You can get contractures, skin breakdown, you know, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of stuff that could happen, um, uh, you know, in these situations. There's also compartment syndrome and fat embolism. And we're going to kind of break those down as those are kind of big guns um, each individually. So let's talk about compartment syndrome. So when we're talking about compartment syndrome, this is a perfusion emergency. So when you think compartment syndrome, there you have this compartment, you know, in your muscle um, where your muscle is. And what happens during an injury is there's breakdown, there's inflammation, all these fluids and blood and other stuff gets like kind of, um, you know, filling up the compartment. And there's just not enough space. Um, and what happens is because there's not enough space, it starts pushing on the nerves and the blood vessels and it ends up where there's no blood flow to the extremity. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, all of that extra pressure leads to lack of perfusion. So again, this is a perfusion issue. The early symptoms a patient with compartment syndrome is going to experience is um, things like pain out of proportion to injury or um, pain that's not relieved when they ice it or elevate it or take medications. Um, also, they can complain of paresthesias, numbness or tingling um, that can happen um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, because of that compression of the nerves in the, those areas. Um, the late symptoms, think about the other P's, the um, unable to move their foot uh, or like, you know, if it's a different limb or their hands, you know, unable um, to get a regular color. Cause normally, you know, if you have good perfusion to a limb, it's going to be pink or red, um, but they usually get kind of pale with the, as a late sign of compartment syndrome, poikilothermia, which is temperature. So the temperature gets really cool or cold, and then they also can lose their pulse. Um, and so think about um, those as late symptoms. So early pain and paresthesias, the late is going to be all the other P's. Um, the role of the nurse in compartment syndrome is going to be to remove any cast or device that's going to be making blood flow worse and call the doctor. And when I say, and then keep in mind, you know, um, you know, we need to call the doctor as soon as possible because there's nothing that I can do in this situation. Aside from removing excess pressure, the doctor has to come in and usually the treatment is going to be what we call a fasciotomy, which is going to relieve pressure. Um, so, uh, you know, as soon as possible, I need to call that physician. I'm not going to be doing a whole bunch of assessments or things as soon as I see that the patient is experiencing compartment syndrome, like they're having that pain out of proportion, um, signs of decreased blood flow, those paresthesias, things like that. I am going to call the doctor because this is a time is muscle kind of thing that I could completely lose this limb if I don't call the doctor soon enough. There's also fat embolism sy sy syndrome, and this is something very different. This is a respiratory neurological emergency. So this is also an emergency, but this is a little different. So just like you can get blood clots um, that can block, you know, um, different vessels in your body, you can also get fat globules and fat embolism sy syndrome that can block blood flow. And usually they end up because they're tinier, they're not like big, big, big globs that are causing blockages in big vessels, but they're going to small vessels in the lungs and the brain. So they're causing a lot of um, difficulty and you're going to kind of see, you know, a lot of your symptoms manifest in the respiratory and neurological systems. In the respiratory system, you know, you're going to see like decreased oxygenation, like lower oxygen saturations, um, tachypnea, dyspnea, like complaining I can't breathe. They may also be confused and restless and that's how their neurological manifestations. So you can see how this is different than compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is happening usually in the, wherever the injury is at, whereas this is happening in the respiratory system and in the neurological system and their symptoms are going to be very different. You know, those early symptoms of compartment syndrome are going to be those, um, those paresthesias and the pain out of proportion where this patient's having more, you know, breathing issues um, and that restlessness confusion. Um, the role for a patient that's getting fat embolism is to support their oxygenation and their safety because they may be confused um, and then they also are struggling to breathe. Um, my, the only thing I can do, there's no cure for fat embolism syndrome because I can't break down fat. I can't give anticoagulation for this because anticoagulation breaks down 
um, anticoagulation uh, doesn't break down. Anticoagulation stops you from forming more clots, but it can't stop you from more, forming more fat. So these are fat globules that are, um, you know, going out throughout your body. So um, I really just have to support them and their symptoms. They may need to be on the ventilator. I need to support their oxygenation. They're going to need IV fluids to kind of dilute and flush out some of the, those um, fat particles. Um, and then I want to protect for the patient's safety. Um, prevention is going to be key for these patients. I want to stabilize fractures early. Usually this shows up a lot earlier um, in the, uh, what do you call it, um, fracture period. Like when a patient comes in, it's usually within the tw first 24 to 48 hours. So I'm going to be looking for those respiratory and neurological manifestations of this. There's also, um, you know, the immobility complications that can happen. So it's my role as the nurse to help prevent some of these complications as well. So, um, you know, like I mentioned, you can have fat, um, you know, um, blockages like the fat embolism, but you can also have a blood clot as well. So because this patient's not moving because of their fracture, um, I need to make sure that I'm supporting them um, and making, uh, supporting them and trying to prevent them from getting a blood clot by supporting their mobility. Um, SCDs, TED hose, and ambulation are going to be some of my best ways that I can prevent blood clots in a patient that's had a fracture. Of course, mobility as ordered. Um, also, they can have contractures, weakness, or foot drop. And so I want to encourage active and passive range of motion. If they can't move certain areas of their body, certain limbs, then I'm going to help them with that with some passive range of motion. I'm going to use splints or devices to encourage a normal anatomical position. So we talked about like those foot drop boots. Um, when we talked about stroke, we can also use them here. Um, if there's any sort of other supportive device for their hands, you know, we talked about those, uh, we caught um, hand cones and stuff like that in stroke. They might use some something like that. So pretty much I just want to put them in a normal anatomical position to keep that um, regular functioning and um, strength so that um, when they're recovering from whatever uh, fracture or other um, injury they have that they don't um, experience these same complications of immobility. And then getting physical therapy and occupational therapy involved is very helpful. Um, additionally, I'm worried about stomach ulcer for, um, formation. I mean, they can get a stomach or a, you know, an intestinal ulcer, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I really want to prevent these. They're going to usually be on what's called PPI or proton pump inhibitor prophylaxis. And we'll talk about that in the last section. Um, but effectively it's going to help prevent them when you're in the hospital, you're more stressed out. So you're more likely to get an ulcer. Um, also getting them started on nutrition and supporting their nutrition is going to be helpful to prevent those kind of complications. So other complications that can happen, um, skin breakdown, I want to make sure I'm turning them every two hours, protecting their pressure points and doing regular skin assessments to make sure that um, their skin is um, it's still, um, it's blanchable um, and that they're not having any break new breakdown. Um, I want to, um, you know, treat their pain and spasms with analgesics and muscle relaxers because, um, you know, chronic pain can result from immobility. Um, it, being stuck in a bed with a fracture, you know, can lead to a lot more pain. Sometimes as, as crazy as it sounds, actually getting up and moving around can decrease some of the pain because there's um, being stuck in bed all day long, immobile can lead to a lot more pain. It can lead to pain in other areas aside from where your fracture's at. Um, there's also, of course, a risk of, um, because of immobility, a risk of infection. Um, so I want to make sure I'm using aseptic technique, doing good pin care every shift, um, antibiotics, um, you know, especially if they're having surgery before, during, after, um, and tetanus prophylaxis for those patients that had open fractures. So yeah, so those are just kind of an, a simple breakdown of some of those complications. So hopefully these simplified this for uh, these simplified um, some of the differences for you in some of these complications and helps you to get a better idea of the direction to kind of move in to how you can start to look at these complications and how you can, as the nurse, prevent some of these complications. So hope it helped. Talk to you next time.